this video we will go through all the required formulas for the AQA physics course for A level. My name is Jason and I just graduated from secondary school and have achieved the result of A star with a converted UMS score of 95% for my A level of physics. The best way to go through A level of physics is actually the equation sheet because the equation sheet is the number one tool for doing your A-level physics exams and you have to know where the equations are, what the equations are, what each symbol means and how to use these equations inside out. We'll go through all the required equations within the equation sheet as well as equations that are not explicitly listed in the equation sheet that you still need for your exams and this includes all the core topics from topic one all the way to the topic of nuclear physics and we'll go through the option of turning points in physics as well and because that's the option that I did this video will only go through the year one part of the AQA course and the constants to the geometric equations particle physics all the way to electricity click the link down below or the card above if you want to look at the year two part of this video where we go through all the equations required in year two without further ado let's get straight into it as you can see officially it's called the aqa a level physics data and formally booklet and it's for use in exams from 2017 onwards so the number one tip i have when you're revising physics and doing physics past paper questions topic questions or even questions on your textbook the textbooks i recommend is the official oxford physics textbook as well as the cgp physics textbook as well make sure you print out this formula sheet at the start of your lower six and use the formula sheet throughout your a level physics journey because when you have the actual formula sheet with you you'll get used to the formula sheet so well so for me I printed out my formula sheet at the start of lower six and from a two year journey I used the same formula sheet it got really really rusted at the end but really, really good practice because that's what you'll get exactly on your real exam as well so from the first page you have a series of constants and we'll obviously go through these constants we'll be using them in the formulas now it's important to note that there are a few constants that are not actually used in the core modules so the constant the stefan constant as well as the Wien constant is only used for the astrophysics module so if you're confused if you went through the entire two-year course and you don't know why it's there that's because it's used for the astrophysics these units are provided so that's really important because questions especially multiple choice questions where you are required to derive a standard unit or an SI unit of a particular physical quantity, these units could come in useful for the derivation. Now as for the algebraic equation, it gives you the quadratic equation. It might be weird, it wasn't used until recently on a 2020 paper where it was used in a projectile question involving SUVAT. That was to find the time when it reached a certain height and obviously in a projectile you would launch a projectile and it would reach a certain height at two points in time and that was used the quadratic equation was actually used at that time at that question however you could always solve quadratics with the new a level calculators but i remember from the mark scheme of that particular question to solve a quadratic it's always always very important or useful or you would gain a working mark by just showing the quadratic equation even though you're using a quadratic equation solver on your calculator just show in your subbed in quadratic as for your astronomical data with the sun and the earth this is constantly used when you're dealing with gravitational fields to do with orbits and the gravitational field chapter geometric equations these can confuse a lot of students especially the arc length equation the theta in the arc length equation has to be given in radians so radians are an alternative measure of angles you should cover them at the start of year one when you're doing with phase difference but if you haven't you should cover them in year two when you're doing angular speed and circular motion so radians is where 2 pi equals 360 degrees circumference of a circle sometimes it can be involved in for example resistivity questions where a wire is looped around a cylinder and to calculate the length of the wire you obviously have to calculate the circumference of one loop and multiply 
by the amount of loops the wire has on the cylinder. The area of circle is actually used quite a lot in physics. This could be, for example, used for the area within the resistivity equation as well as the area for, for example, pressure. Curved surface area of a cylinder is not as used. The area of a sphere, that is the total surface area of the sphere and is sometimes used for questions modeling radioactivity in regards to the inverse square law. The volume of the sphere is constantly used because in the gravitational fields chapter where we calculate forces, for example, between planets, we do model all planets as perfect spheres. Now let's get straight into each topic. Now I won't dwell into each topic in too much detail or else this will be like a 12 hour long video. You still need to learn and make sure you understand what's going on in the topic. So I do recommend actually for the preview textbook or my free AL physics notes on factorycall.com to help you understand it. And if you want to memorize the content, I also have Anki flashcards available to download on factorycall.com, link down below. So let's get straight to particle physics. So there's a secret hidden trick within this table of particle classifications. So if you're always in doubt what decays into what, because it is quite confusing sometimes, this table actually tells you in secret. So for the baryons, the neutron would naturally decay into a proton because a proton would be the most stable. And for the mesons, K meson would decay into a pi meson. And the pi meson would decay into a muon, and the muon would decay into an electron, which is the most stable form. There is sort of a little trend of going upwards to stability, especially from the electron to k meson, as well from the proton to neutron. So that's a little secret, little hack. In regards to rest energy, these are used for calculations involving in annihilation and pair production. So annihilation is when a particle and an antiparticle collide. And with the collide, they would produce two gamma rays with the exact same energy. The energy of the gamma ray would equal to the rest energy of either the particle or the antiparticle. This rest energy can also be used to calculate pair production. So pair production is when the gamma ray of sufficient energy is used to produce its particle and antiparticle pair. So we've got the particle and antiparticle. The energy of the gamma ray coming in must equal to at least twice the rest energy of the particle because obviously we're producing a particle antiparticle pair from one gamma photon. So now let's talk about the properties of quarks or quarks. Use this table when figuring out quark configurations, especially unknown and known quark configurations. If you don't know the proton is up, up, down, you can always check by up is two thirds and down is negative a half and therefore that would equal to plus one charge which works out for the proton and therefore it also works out for the neutron which is up down down and with using this table we know that's two thirds plus two thirds minus a third minus a third equal to zero which is what the neutron is with neutral charge and zero overall charge. Baryon number, self-explanatory. With mesons, we always have a baryon number of zero because it's composed of a quark and an anti-quark and therefore the baryon number would always be plus a third, minus a third, equal to zero. So therefore it's not a baryon. Here is just a gentle reminder that the exam friendly little reminder to tell you that the antiparticle would have a negative lepton number, vice versa. Now let's get into the quantum phenomena topic. Photon energy, E equals HF. E is energy of the photon, is the quantized energy, so it's measured in joules. H is Planck's constant, and it will be given to you at page one of the data sheet within the constant. So that's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And F is the frequency of the photon and that will be given in Hertz. So if you're given the frequency of a photon, the frequency of a light, you could calculate the respective photon energy by just multiplying it by the Planck's constant. If your frequency is not given, you can always convert frequency by doing the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So if you're given the wavelength, you could always use E equals HC over lambda 
where h is the Planck's constant and c is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, and that's given at the first page of the data sheet. And lambda is the wavelength, which is given in meters. So instead of frequency, if you're given wavelength of light, you could also calculate the photon energy level of that respective light particle by doing E equals HC over lambda. Now let's move on to Einstein's photoelectric effect. HF, again, going back, and that is the photon energy. Now this is the photon that's being emitted on to the photoelectric surface. So this could be a metal surface that emits electrons, but this is, remember, this is the photon that goes in to and emitted onto the surface. Circle with a dash through it is the work function. So this is the minimum amount of energy needed for photoelectrons to be released from the metal surface. So it's sort of like the tax. So you put in a certain amount of money, it takes away a certain amount of money, but it also releases some amount of money, which is the kinetic energy of the electron. So the work function is given in joules, and we have the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectron, and that's also given in joules. So it does work out all the units are in joules. Energy levels. This is the emission of photons when an electron is de-excited from a higher energy to lower energy level. HF again is the photon energy that's being emitted due to the de-excitation. The photon of light that's being emitted from the de-excitation of an electron within an atom. So E1 is the higher energy level. So this will be the energy level that will be less negative. That's given in joules. And E2 would be the lower energy level or the more negative energy level. Because remember, all energy levels are negative and the top energy level would definitely be zero, which means the electron is free. All energy levels are negative. If you do a less negative minus a more negative energy level would therefore we get a positive energy, which is the photon energy released because we're doing E1 minus minus E2. So always remember to do the higher energy level minus the lower energy level. The De Broglie wavelength is defined as the Planck's constant, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, divided by the momentum of the particle. So the momentum of the particle is given in units kilograms meter per second. This is the wavelength associated with a certain particle due to the wave particle duality effect. And again, this is just, and again, the equation next to it is just the definition of what momentum is, and that's the mass given in kilograms, multiplied by velocity, which is given in meter per second. And of course, that's the De Broglie wavelength of a particle, and that'll be in meters. So the De Broglie wavelength of a common particle, a common day-to-day -day particle, like for example, the De Broglie wavelength of a ball, would be ridiculously small due to small magnitude of Planck's constant. However, if the particle is getting smaller and smaller with a smaller mass or a smaller velocity, then the De Broglie wavelength will increase. Now let's get to waves. Everyone's favorite topic. So wave speed is the speed of the wave in meter per second. Now this is a bit weird. It's given in C. It could be given in the V as well, but it's given in C. And don't confuse it with the speed of light which obviously when you're calculating waves from the electromagnetic spectrum, it is C, but if you're calculating, for example, water waves, don't confuse it with the speed of light. So this is, in this equation, is a speed of wave, including all waves, not just electromagnetic waves. F is the frequency, given in hertz. You can tell that if you rearrange for frequency, we get C over lambda, which is what's plugged in and substituted in into the E equals HF equation. Lambda is wavelength, given in meters. Equation six, frequency is divided by the reciprocal of the time period, which is given in seconds. 
and that's really just the definition of frequency. The first harmonic of a stationary wave, and this only applies to a stationary wave that's in resonance to form the first harmonic. With the first harmonic, we have two nodes and one anti-node. And the length of the wire is actually half the wavelength. So the anti-node would be the one in the middle and it would vibrate up and down. And the nodes would be at the either end of the string. L is the length of the wire. So you can see that it is cropping in the one half of the length of the wire to give the wavelength. And you can see it is part of the equation. T is the tension of the wire given in Newtons. Now, if this is a tension causing due to the weight pulling down onto a string from a pulley system, then you could use tension equals mg, where m is the mass of the weight and g is the exertion due to gravity on Earth, which is 9.81. Mu is the mass per unit length, and this is the one that always confuses people, given in kilograms per meter. The mass per unit length is the property of the string of the stationary wave. And there are some questions where the mass per unit length is actually not given and you have to work it out. And mu can also be worked out from the density of the wire or the cable multiplied by the area of the cable is given in kilogram per meter cubed. And therefore, if you multiply by the cross-sectional area given in meter squared, we get kilogram per meter. So I saw this crop up on the paper three before and it was really, really tricky. So that equation is good to know at the back of your heads where mu, the mass per unit length, not area, not volume, is the density multiplied by the area. And you could definitely derive that by just looking at the units of density times area. Fringe spacing is talking about double slit. Remember, this is double slit, not single slit. There is a different equation for a single slit, the fraction which is not needed for the AQA specification. W is the fringe spacing in meters. Lambda is the wavelength of the incident light given in meters. S is a slit spacing. Now be careful, this is not the distance or the length of the slit, but is the distance between the two slits. It is a big, big difference. D is the distance between the slits and the screen given in meters. The fraction grating. D is the distance between slits given in meters. Theta is the angle given in degrees. And N is the order, which means that the order is that it appears to have a maxima on the screen. So it could be first, second, third, order, etc. Lambda is the wavelength of the instant light given in meters. Now it's very careful how you deal with D in this equation. If it gives you the number of slits per millimeter, for example, you have to divide one millimeter, convert that to a meter, and divide that by the number of slits. So there is an alternative equation where D equals one meter over number of slits in one meter. So if it's not given in a meter, if, if it's given in number of slits per millimeter, then you have to make sure you do one millimeter times 10 to the minus three over the number of slits. Now to find out the maximum order, we could plug in sine 90, which, e which equals to one in this equation, and get N equals D over lambda. And that gets us the maximum order if we round down instead of up. So make sure you round down if you're being asked to find the maximum order using the equation. And max equals D over lambda. So this is derived by plugging in sine 90 and rearranging for N. The diffraction grating equation, you have to know how you can derive it using trigonometry. Here, is a brief slash of how you derive it. 
using trig. It has not been asked for a while. Last time I saw a question on deriving the diffraction gradient equation was in an old spec exam paper, but still it is in the spec, so make sure you know how to derive this equation. The refractive index of a substance that's simply defined by the speed of light divided by the speed of light in that material and that's given in meter per second. For different substances for refractive indices N1 and N2 we have the law of refraction which is called the Snell's law. N1 is the refractive index first refractive index and theta 1 is the angle of incidence and make sure when you're finding the angle of incidence don't get tricked out because it's always the angle to the normal when you're finding the angle of an instance within the fraction question the angle of incidence in this case theta 1 is the angle to the normal so it's the angle to the red is the red angle but not not the green angle so never ever use a green angle within Snell's law and same case with theta 2 the angle of diffraction we would use the red angle which is the angle to the normal and do not ever use this angle the green angle always use the angle to the normal and 2 is the second refractive index the substance will be the second substance that light is in to cause the refraction the theta 2 is the angle refraction given in degrees the critical angle now this is simply by plugging in sine 90 into Snell's law for theta 2 and we can get the critical angle is n2 over n1 and n2 is the second refractive index so remember this is the second material that the light is in and n1 is the first refractive index and theta is the critical angle now to find a critical angle make sure you do inverse sine of the ratio between n2 and n1 and it's given in degrees now let's get on to mechanics this is a very obvious equation but is helpful i guess it's given to you the moment is defined as a force of a particular particular action multiplied by the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the pivot so this is always the perpendicular distance because it's always the closest distance the perpendicular distance from the line of action to the pivot and the unit of force is newton and the unit of the distance is meter so the unit for the moment of a force would be given in newton meter velocity in meter per second is defined as the rate of change of displacement where s is the displacement or distance given in meter and t is time given in seconds so in a displacement time graph the rate of change is represented by the gradient of the graph and so if you draw a tangent at a particular point of a displacement time graph you will find the instantaneous velocity at each time same case with acceleration which is in meter per second squared is a rate of change of velocity so this is the change in velocity given in meter per second over the change in time which is given in seconds so on a velocity time graph the gradient of the velocity would represent the acceleration at that point in time these equations of motions are called suvat equations and they all have the same symbols so suvat s u v a t s is a displacement is a distance from the initial point to the final point during that time now remember these equations of motion only apply with constant acceleration that means that acceleration is remaining the same throughout the whole point in time so this could be for example free fall where the acceleration is just g 9.81 meters per second squared however if the object is accelerating variably so it's accelerating quicker as time goes on then these equations cannot be used at all variable acceleration these equations cannot be used at all u is the initial speed 
or it's better off using we'll use vectors initial velocity given the meter per second v is the final velocity of the object given the meter per second a is the acceleration and this has to be a constant number of the object in meter per second squared and t is the time throughout the journey given in seconds so these all mean the same thing in these equations of motion newton's second law f equals ma force given in newtons is the mass given in kilograms and this could be regards to the inertial mass how much force is needed to cause the object to move multiplied by acceleration which is given in meters per second actually the original form of newton's second law is actually force is defined as the rate of change of momentum where nv is momentum so this is momentum given in kilogram meter per second and time is the given in second and again force is in newtons and if we multiply by time we can get impulse which is simply the change in momentum so impulse is defined as the change in momentum so impulse the unit newton seconds the change in momentum so given in kilograms so meter per second so you have to find the initial momentum or the final momentum and find the difference between them in order to find the impulse of an object work done is given by force given in newtons so work done is given in joules times by the distance so the, if the angle is zero then the distance will be the perpendicular distance that the object has traveled due to the influence of the force if the action of the force is inclined at an angle then we apply the cos theta to it where theta is the angle of the force to the ground to the action of movement which is given in degrees so if a box is being pushed at an angle like 30 degrees then we have to use cos 30 times by force times by the distance it traveled to find the work done on the box kinetic energy is calculated by half nv squared where m is the mass of the object v is the velocity of the object this kinetic energy equation can only be used at non-relativistic speeds which means that speeds are that are not close to the speed of light if speeds are close to the speed of light we have to use an alternative equation which is covered under the turning points in the physics module gravitational potential energy of an object is given by its mass multiplied by 9.81 multiplied by the height of the object given in meters now this equation can only be used at small values of height so in regard to a real life day-to-day -day values of height and if we're talking about planetary heights for example distance from the surface of the earth to an orbit to a different planet or an artificial satellite then we cannot use this equation we have to use equations in the gravitational fields module and find a difference in potential energy by calculating the potential energy at that point minus potential energy at a different point to find a change but in this case if we're dealing with real life on the ground surface type earth type mechanics then we could approximate it very well using gp equals mgh these two equations are often linked and in questions that re regard the change in energy states for example when an object is rolling down for, when a ball is rolling down a slope well, all of its gravitational potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy so you could equate these equations mgh equals half nv squared and therefore you could find for example the velocity of the object when it's at the ground so as you can see the mass is independent and we get that v equals square root of 2gh so the velocity of an object falling down is simply the square root of 2 times 9.81 
time by the height where the object has fell from in this scenario. P is power is defined as rate of change of energy or work done, work done given in joules and time given in seconds. P is power given in watts. So this also is power, which is the force multiplied by the velocity in meter per second. Now the force and the velocity has to be constant in this case because the equation doesn't really account for any variable force or variable velocity. So in other words, the object that someone's pushing, so you want to calculate the power input in that particular action, the object has cannot be accelerating in this scenario. Efficiency, very self-explanatory, literally tells you it's useful output power divided by input power. Now this, the uh, efficiency must be less than or equal to one, or if you multiply by 100, must be less than or equal to 100%. And because you won't have more useful output power, than the input power because that's literally physically impossible. So now let's move on to materials. Now with materials, the number one equation here is density. This is actually very clutch, this equation. This is a fundamental equation and it's a definition for density given in rho. So density, it's given in kilogram per meter cubed. And we can tell it's kilogram per meter cubed because it's the mass in kilogram divided by the volume in meter cubed. So this is big V, it's not little v, so there's a little tiny difference. The little v is a little bit curved. This is big V, which is volume. So in case of a cube, it would just be the side length cubed. If it's a spear, you have to use one of these uh, geometric equations, it would be 4 thirds pi r cubed. We have Hooke's law here, which states that the force acting on a spring, given in newtons, is proportional to its extension, given in meters. So this is delta L, so to find the extension, you have to do the new length minus the original length. So that's for its delta to change in length and k is just a constant in this case, and the spring constant would be different depending on different material, and the unit for the spring is constant in Newton per meter, because that's F divided by L. Young's modulus is defined by tensile stress over strain. Pretty self-explanatory here, and when we sub in these two equations in Young's modulus, we actually get stress, which is force over area, divided by strain, which is delta L over L. So therefore, if we just clean this up a little bit, it will be FL over A delta L. And you'll be using that equation quite a lot. You can just easily derive that by just subbing in the tensile stress and tensile strain equations into the Young modulus. So that means it's the force in this case, tensile stress is the force applied to, for example, an object divided by the area that the force has been applied on. So this would have the same units as pressure because pressure is also force divided by area. So it would give you units of pascals or in SI will be Newton per meter squared. Tensile strain has no units because its, its ratio of the extension in meters divided by the length of the object or like for example a string uh, that the material that you're investigating. So it's meter divided by meter therefore it's no units. The energy stored in the spring can be found by half FL. So if you're plotting a graph of extension against force, the energy stored would be the area underneath the, the graph because it's the area of the triangle, which is 
half base times height. So half base, which is the force, base is the force, and the height is delta L. So therefore, it's half FL. And if we substitute F for KL using Hooke's law, we actually get, and we just substitute that in, we can also find the energy stored by spring constant times by the extension squared. So that's another form of the equation. So now let's get on to electricity. One of either most loved or most hated topics. Personally, I hated this topic. Questions are the most weirdest questions ever on the AQA exams. So current, so this is the definition of current, like defines what current is, the rate of flow of charge. So this is charge in coulombs and T is time in seconds. That's current in amperes. So voltage is defined by the work done per unit charge, coulombs. So resistance is voltage divided by current. More commonly, a form is V equals IR, which is Ohm's law, which is voltage in volts divided by current in amps and we have resistance in ohms now it's very important that when you're analyzing graphs iv graphs or vi graphs for example if the iv graph is not a straight line and you're trying to find resistance you can get easily fooled by all looking at resistance and voltage divided by current so in this case of an iv graph it will be the reciprocal of the gradient and if i just draw a tangent of that and find the reciprocal of the gradient or the tangent you could find the resistance at that point that is completely wrong in electricity you would never draw a tangent on an iv graph because resistance is literally defined by the voltage at that point of voltage divided by the current at that point so it's not the rate of change of voltage in respect to current so there's no like dv di or change in voltage of a change in i so you would never ever draw a tangent to find resistance in the case of a for example vi graph you would think that the gradient would give you the resistance no you have to actually find two points like that draw a straight line and find a difference uh, in, in for example i1 and i2 and v1 and v2 and find resistance through that way so never ever draw a tangent on any electrical IG graphs or VI graphs to find resistance. So resistivity in the units of ohm meters is defined by the product of resistance in ohms divided by the cross-sectional area. So often it will be a wire. So often you have to use pi r squared to find the cross-sectional area divided by the length of the wire in the meters. Resistance in series and resistance in parallel. Resistance series is just the addition of all the resistances in of all the components in series. So this it does tell you you don't have to actually learn it, but it is very seemingly obvious because it's a rule that you learn all the way back from GCSE. And resistance in parallel, it's the reciprocal of all the sums of all the resistances. Electrical power, so this is electrical power given watts. So it is still energy, the rate of change of energy. But in the case of given current and voltages, you could find the the electrical power uh, if you're not given energy, if you're not given time, you could find it by doing the product of the voltage and current. And if you sub in uh, Ohm's law V equals IR uh, in multiple ways of form, uh, you can also derive these into I squared R or V squared R. So it's very convenient that it tells you all the derivations of power here instead of memorizing it and what you what you have what you had to do in GCSE where you had to memorize this. It just tells you all here so you could see which form you're gonna use depending on what information you're given in the question. EMF, electromotive force, given volts is defined by the amount of energy uh, the battery produces and transfers to electrical energy per unit of charge coulombs so in, in essence it's the voltage sort of like the voltage supplied by the battery emf is sort of the input it's where all the electrical energy is from and where it's voltage where you spend um, all that electrical energy so it's the output towards all the components in the circuit
equation here is to do with internal resistance. So whereas, for example, ohms law V equals IR. So an alternative equation I would say is EMF is the terminal PD plus the lost voltage. Because the lost voltage has gone in to supply towards internal resistance. So this little R here is internal resistance. It's a resistance due to the battery. So it's a hindrance of the flow of charge due to the battery. It's given in ohms and this is the circuit resistance. So it's the big R, it's the resistance that you, you're all familiar with. And I is the current. So if it's more, it's more easily understood if you think about uh, EMF is all the like the voltage the energy you're supplying per unit charge and some of it is lost to supply uh, the internal resistance in the battery and most of it the big V is being used to supply obviously the stuff we need the light bulbs all the circuit components anyways that's all the year one equations. I know this has been a very, very long video. If you want to look at the year two part of this course where we go on from circular motion to nuclear physics as well as turning points in physics, please click the card above. Uh, the link towards that video is down below in the description. If this video gave you any value, please exchange some value by just pressing that subscribe button down below. It really means the world to me. And I'll be producing more productivity, revision and self-development videos on this YouTube channel. Click here for another one of my awesome videos and I will see you guys in my next video. Hasta luego.